Hi, I'm Matti Mali aka Hedonistic Actor and I do one of these uh, worst, worst films I've ever seen uh, listings in a row because my Macbeth review is uh, taking some time but it should become either tomorrow or day after that. Okay, let's... and today we have some from numbers 40 to 31 and number 40 is 202... oh sorry 102 Dalmatians. Yeah, it's a live action version. There's apparently a, a, an animated movie of the same name, which is a sequel to the 1961 animated classic, which I haven't seen. Um, the previous, uh, the 901. <laughs> 101 Dalmatians, uh, the live-action version from 1996. Uh, yeah, it's an alright movie. It has uh, lots of action and Glenn Close as the Cruella de Vil who wants to kill those puppies and make fur out of them. It's uh, quite a menacing. 102 Dalmatians is the it has the same problem like many sequels who try that try to do more and adds us more stuff and in this the Cruella who was arrested during the previous movie is they are trying to heal her but it doesn't really work and I can't much and it also apparently has a zero de badieu as um, her old colleague who also wants to kill animals. Just because. Okay, I don't actually remember that much of the plot and uh, I can't even uh, judge the acting because I've only seen the finished dub version. <laughs> yeah. I, these days I don't uh, watch la dubs if they are live-action dubs because um, I have some principles that uh, stealing one's voice is... Uh... <laughs> okay, yeah. And uh, this is one of those kind of a nah, kids movies that I don't want to waste, waste too much time on. So let's just say that it's uh, loud and obnoxious and Kind of like the number 39 and the Flintstones in Viva Rock Vegas. And the first Flintsto Flintstones movie. Flintstones movie. It was also an okay film. Um, John Goodman as the Flintstone. What was his first name again? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, he was uh, good and a lot of manic energy and. Uh, and the rest of the cast weren't bad either. And yeah, its plot was kind of a simple, but you know, it was harmless. And, well, none of the original cast are in this movie. John Goodman has been replaced by Mark Addy, whoever that the heck is. And then there's Stephen Baldwin and Jane Krakowski and Joan Allen. And uh, this is one of the... this is uh, actually a prequel to the f first uh, live-action Flintstones movie. It has... It uh, basically tells that how the Flintstones... What was the other couple? Rock Pebbles met each other? Um, this is for those who don't know what Flintstones is. It's this... Uh, Humans exist in prehistoric time, and they have uh, kind. They have invented cars and stuff, but without the, all the fancy motorcycles. They have a kind of a modern society with uh, archaic technology kind of thing, which I guess is a funny in itself. But yeah. And I got to be honest, I don't remember much about this movie. Well, I remember that there was the annoying alien, played by Alan Cumming. What was his name? I don't remember what was his name, Zebot or something, but I know that many 
fans of Flintstones franchise hate this character. So yeah, it was a wise choice to put him in into this movie, yeah. But honestly, and that's pretty much all I remember, and uh, I didn't bother to check this Wikipedia entry because uh, I have movies in today's listing that I feel are much that I can get much more out of and feel that I should talk about more of them. So let's go to the next one, one of the your examples of uh, classic bad movies, Batman and Robin. Uh, yeah, the fourth movie in the Batman and the old Batman and Robin movie quadrilogy that started with the 1989's Batman. And uh, first, I want to say that I I liked the previous movie Batman Forever, even even though both. Both Two-Face and Riddler, the villains, are basically the Joker. They're just all going, I don't manic and stuff. And, uh, well, Kilmer is an okay Batman, yeah. Well, this time Batman is George Clooney and... Uh, you know, that... That is a good casting choice, but... This uh, movie just went too far in its uh, childlike uh, attitude and... Uh, yeah, one critic has said that uh, this movie is a prime example of what happens when everybody is interested about nothing else but their paychecks, and you can kind of see that the plot process makes absolutely no sense. And then there's some bizarre casting shots, like Arnold Schwarzenegger as Mr. Freeze. You know the tragic villain whose uh, wife is in the tube and he is trying to get a way to cure him and there's uh, so much pain in him and... Okay, to be fair, uh, Mr. Schwarzenegger does occasionally manage to bring that up, but... Uh, otherwise, it's just also hidden under those uh, weird accent and uh, over... Bombastic ice bombs, uh, time to kick some ice, what killed the dinosaurs, the ice age and that stuff. And then there's Emma Thurman as Poison Ivy, who is just, just uninspiredly over the top uh, seducing, who actually isn't that seducing because she's trying too hard. And it has also. So, Bane, which is just a mindless tank. At least, uh, what was it, Dark Knight Returns manages to make that character much more compelling. And, oh, and also there's the Batgirl, played by Alicia Silverstone, which just... who so should be the butler's Butler Alfred's niece, but uh, she can do English accent. And, uh, and Chris O'Donnell as Robin is okay, although the character does tend to whine a lot. Yeah, at least uh, Batman and Robin is a better superhero movie than the next one on the list, Superman 3. I haven't actually seen the fourth Superman, which I, to my understanding, is even worse. I've seen the Nostalgia Critic Linkara crossover review that they released in 2009, and it seemed like a movie I don't want to watch. And Superman 3 was a bad in itself because it, well, it has basically the same problem as Batman and Robin. It tries to go too much into the comedy aspect and. Because the first and second movie had some levity in it and uh, some stronger drama and when it's uh, thrown away in this third one and there's also this uh, weird case where 
there's two Supermans. Somehow, I don't remember it anymore how, Superman gets split into a good side and a bad side, and they apparently fight. And then there's some weird computer genius, uh, which basically is... Uh, I think his name was Weber? Which basically is a lot of like... Uh, Lex Luthor, but uh, not as memorable or charismatic. They, I don't understand why they could just use Lex Luthor or some other villain in this, but... And then there's, of course, infamously Richard Pryor as this um, constantly comedic uh, sidekick to Superman who just bumbles around the movie and... Um, yeah. And there's this all, of course, the old cast Christopher Reeve as Superman and Margot Kidder as Lois Lane, but it just feels uninspired for both of them. And yeah, it was a stupid movie. And yeah, there's a, another stupid superhero movie, Robocop 3. <laughs> well, I guess um, Robocop is a superhero in a sense, as Batman is kind of the superhero, even though he doesn't have any superpowers, but anyway. I liked the first Robocop movie, and the second one was uh, alright as well. Even though it hadn't, didn't have the best plot, but it has some rather neat characters. And... But the third movie... And once again, it's a, once again this... They want to go into the kids movie route then. There's this uh, one child child character who is this computer genius and uh, she's uh, so preppy and uh, annoyingly cheery and stuff. Although one although I I distinctly remember that that movie had a good um, cinematography. There's uh, one, this uh, clever cut, uh, cut change, scene change, where three men uh, died and they fall, and in the next shot they are transformed into domino pieces, and yeah. And for those who don't know, it's a Robocop, it's about a futuristic co cop in futuristic Detroit, and uh, I should also mention about Robocop 3 that uh, it kind of uh, ignores one key plot procession point from the second movie and goes to do its own thing. Um, yeah, there's a different Robocop, Robert John Burke, who uh, is kind of forgettable. And then there's uh, this Japanese company that tries to take over of something. There's Meiko and Riptorn and... Uh, and there's the ridiculous ending climax where there's this two robotic samurais and fight against Robocop. But Okay, number 35, The Adventures of Ford Fairlane. And I promise this is the last Rennie Harley directed uh, film in this movie. Uh, this movie is about this kind of an detective played by Andrew Dice Clay, who apparently is this kind of an hated comedian. Uh, I don't... I don't sure what this... Uh, his unfunny comedy aspects as the persona he's playing. Apparently some kind of a deconstruction of these offensive comedians. But anyway, he plays this kind of a detective that uh, uh, investigates crimes that happen in a rock and roll world. And there's... Um, he's trying to find... there's a, some conspiracy. Uh, where is this woman, woman played by Priscilla Presley involved and uh, then there's some kid who is trying to 
look for his father and uh, or fairly he's trying to investigate that and just sort of conspiracy and action and uh, I just thought it was unfunny and uh, obnoxious and there's uh, I don't want I I should have read this movie's Wikipedia article because once again I don't remember a single thing from the broad progress, but I guess I have movies to talk about that uh, made me feel stronger emotions. So let's go to the let next one, Atlantis, Mi Milo's Return. Yeah, this is the in the, this is the last of those uh, Disney sequels that they made in the early to mid 2000s and. Uh, with the first Atlantis movie, I thought it was passable. It didn't have that many memorable characters, but there was cool actions and it was an alright action flick, but something that I forget the next day. Uh, Milo's return though, and once again I can't just the original acting because I was the dub version, but it has three stories, kind of like in Darzan and Jane, which was also in this list, and uh, though if all of those stories are unbelievably stupid, and yeah, there's one I remember, there was some sand coyote somewhere, and then there was, what was it? Oh yeah, some guy who thought he was a descendant of the... Norse God of Thunder tour and had some of his uh, own floating castle somewhere. I think it was floating, I may remember it. And then there's some story that had a fish people. And uh, all, of, all of them had the same... Uh, those three stories frame some kind of uh, uh, story device that is Oh, my camera is too long. Uh, that is sold after them, and... Uh, uh, why have I so hard time remembering any of these? Yeah, maybe in this case it's a good thing I forgot. Yeah, let's just go to the next one, which I have a lot more of to say. And in this point, um, Atlantis Miles Return is the last from this list that I gave 3 out of 10 at the Internet Movie Database. So now we have reached those that I gave 2 out of 10. Yeah, so yeah, they must be really, really bad. But so let's go to them. Number 33, See Me Dance. I originally found out about this movie on from a review show, Cheapskate Reviews. Uh, it's a review show where the guy, Michael Whitry, uh, he reviews movies that are can be of, watched from the uh, internet uh, for, for fr legally free. And uh, She Me Dance was the, his show's first episode. And I recommend the guy's work, uh, even though his uh, video reviews have ended recently, he still uh, writes written reviews, and uh, you can watch his stuff from uh, Channel Zero. Uh, it's kind of a same kind of uh, content providing site as Manic Expression, but anyway. Uh, people who know what this movie is may be wondering why I put this uh, movie so even this high in the list, because uh, there are some elements in it that uh, certainly lowers if disagree, like the inept acting and uh, this bizarre plot prog progression that uh, jumps from place to place and forgets certain story elements, but um, there are two things that work in this movie's favor. Uh, first is the premise, which has some brilliant potential. Uh, so, Simi Dance is about this uh, ballerina girl 
who gets leukemia. And uh, this of course upsets her and her father played by the movie's director and writer Greg Robbins. And I think he's the only notable name in this, so I don't bother to list the other actor. So yeah, he's her father who works as um who works on an, um, for a TV channel that provides uh, Christian material and he's basically the provides Dell's is their content provider. And yeah, she gets leukemia and uh, and if the story would have continued in that route, I it would have probably been just your average uh, melodrama that you forget the next thing. But uh, she get well, she has She gets powers from God to to basically turn people into Christians by just by simply touching them. And you know that this uh, like Chips uh, get mentioned in his. Uh, Review this uh, premise has so much potential. Uh, basically, thinking about why God would like to do that and uh, why God and uh, how this kind of uh, broadcasting uh, thoughts could be abused by some greedy guys and. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, the movie doesn't go that route, and uh, it makes it unintentionally reprehensible by that mean. What I mean is that, uh, yeah, it starts as a melodrama, and then uh, at the 45 minute mark, it tries to some kind of religious horror that Satan enters into the picture, and uh, that guy is whoever plays the Satan. Uh, what was his name? Uh, Peter Kent, who is some stuntman. Uh, he promised some menace, but in this movie, Satan is kind of a wimp. And da he is all talk and that, but he doesn't actually do anything noteworthy. And uh, yeah, the movie is kind of like its main character, uh, who who is quite badly acted, is uh, also really shallow and self-centered, uh, unintentionally so, and kind of. Uh, self-righteous because the movie doesn't uh, acknowledge what kind of uh, heinous thing it is to take away person's free will to choose uh, do they want to become Christians or not because that's the whole point of the God's whole saving the humanity plan of uh, uh, sacrificing his own son at the cross so the people's sins will be washed out and uh, they would uh, receive salvation by taking the Christ into their hearts and uh, because uh, when you get this power to turn uh, people into Christians and uh, basically ruin every fr any free will uh, it makes Jesus' sacrifice completely pointless <laughs> yeah this uh, movie made uh, all the Jesus' suffering and uh, hanging in the cross was uh, for nothing. Because uh, 2000 years later, some girl managed to. got a shortcut throw to do the same thing that uh, Jesus tried to achieve during um, his lifetime and after his death. And, uh, and apparently the movie makers themselves don't uh, acknowledge this uh, the moral bankruptcy this movie portrays and uh, yeah but the premise it premise is uh, brilliant but it, they just waste it and another saving grace it is it's comedy both intentional and un in unintentional because uh, whenever uh, the girl, I think Sari was her name, 
she and her father are having conversations. There's some uh, genially. They have some kind of a good chem something resembling a good chemistry. Uh, Greg Robbins were not the most versatile. He manages to do okay with the material he's written himself. Yeah, I think uh, the his character is the most complex one in this whole mess. And uh, but the. Uh, it has some uh, life-tasting uh, humor on my... It's, uh, well, not particularly funny, man, just to bring some kind of hmm out of me. Um, it was a... It had a good heart. The movie has good heart, but it's uh, severely misguided and... It int intentions are good, but... Um, but they say that Road to Hell is puffed with good intentions or something. Well, the makers of this movie probably don't go to hell. I don't claim that, but uh, it's just misguided. And uh, you might be wondering if I already saw a review from it that spoiled the entire thing, then why I would want to watch that even? <laughs> because it, usually I don't watch movies that other people review because of their. But, but I thought the premise itself was uh, so brilliant and full of potential that I watched it from the net. That at least at the time when I watched it, it was uh, legally available for free. And uh, yeah, I can see the potential. It, uh, and I honestly think that I can uh, tell the same story better. So uh, stay tuned. So, let's go to the number 32, Staying Alive. Yeah, I have much more easier time remembering this because uh, Cinema Snob recently reviewed this movie. And uh, it's a sequel to Saturday Night Fever, which has the young John Travolta playing this kind of... Uh, Italian guy who has a dead end job, but uh, he's the king in the disco scene. And uh, why well, I don't think that movie is the uh, kind of a super duper classic that uh, many other people think, I still think it's a good movie. Uh, it has too. I think it has too much uh, padding, but um, it, has, it is a decent drama. Unlike this. Uh, it's sequel, which is directed by Sylvester Stallone, of all people. Uh, it has even more bedding, all those uh, boring dance scenes at the disco, and its uh, main plot is that very thin main plot is that same kind of uh, melodrama, the triangle drama. And uh, it has. The, John Travolta is uh, his character basically learned nothing from the previous movie, and I don't think this movie even acknowledges much of the previous movie. He is an uh, annoying douchebag, and the dialogue is. They, I think they try to the improvisation route, but somehow it's uh, still that, and. Uh, you know, there was the one scene where. The John Travolta character talks with his mother, and that I remember particularly annoying. Then there's this, uh, even the worst, the final dance sequence, the one that the, all these characters have been rehearsed for, Satan's Alley. It's just so, just so weird. All kind of this uh, dark leather and satanic lights and. It's just so bizarre and comes out of nowhere that it's just so much of a head filter. Yeah, just what Cinema Snob's review of that, I think he can manage to explain it better than I do. So let's just go to the final movie today, number 31, Smoking Aces. Um, this is in the 
same way as some of those uh, movies, action movies that try to rip off uh, pulp fiction and try to be uh, kind of this Quentin Tarantino esque bubbling, uh, clever um, dialogue, uh, and lots of action, but uh, yeah, it's a kind of a different way that kind of like I and I like uh, some of those movies. I mean, uh, I think Bud Dog Saints is a good movie, and uh, it has a good mess. It has an inter interesting. Uh, Interesting study of uh, study of is uh, which land is a good thing or not? And uh, Smoky Nations also reminds me a movie that came later, Lucky, Lucky Numbers Living, because it has the same kind of uh, weird kind of uh, plot that goes on several turns and tries to be so clever with its cl turns and. Uh, well, Lucky Numbers Levy was okay, even though its ending was kind of stupid, but uh, Smoky Naces is just of uh, trying too hard dialogue and uh, plot points that made actual make no sense whatsoever and uh, way too many characters are just there though they could have lots of lots of actions and killing. I checked this movie's Wikipedia article to remind me what the plot was about, and yeah, it's messy. There's this uh, one guy played by Jeremy Piven, who is this mafia dude working on Las Vegas in some casino. He's a magician, and uh, he is trying to... Uh, he has a deal with FBI that he could tell some stuff about the mafia. The two FBI agents are play, played by Ryan Reynolds and Ray Liotta, and then several assassins with uh, different agenda are trying to get uh, the Jeremy Piven character dead. And uh, yeah, and there's a, quite a lot of list of those. Uh, ben Affleck, Peter Berg, Common, uh, Andy Garcia, Alicia Keys, Tyrese B. Henson, Chris Pine, Joel Edgerton, Jason Bateman, well not all of them are assassins, but there's a lot of them. This is so many well-known actors in uh, this movie. And uh, yeah, it's a... Uh, and they do a decent, uh, decent job with the stupid material that they have. I don't remember anything, anyone particularly bad or good, they're all just... Uh, are, are just uh, really confused about what the hell is going on around them. And the movie jumps from place to place and... and <laughs> feels like it's uh, inventing stuff as it goes along and... Yeah, I'm not sure. And the, all the things why this whole mess happened was kind of a stupid too, but I won't spoil it because I can believe it myself. Hmm. Um, okay. Well, I guess that was it for today. Be sure to hopefully the Macbeth move. My Macbeth movie review will come soon, but wait for the next uh, worst movie list where we continue with those that I gave 2 out of 10. So yeah, lots of badness is going to follow. Bye.